Oneness modalism influenced the 325 Nicene Creed. This is my 11th part response to Dr. Steve Morrison. Fourth century semi Trinitarians allied with oneness modalists against Arianism in the early 4th century. Church historian B.B. Edwards wrote, and I quote, Athanasius, we all know that Athanasius was a Trinitarian, I call him a semi Trinitarian because the Trinitarian doctrine was not fully developed into the 5th century rather than the 4th century. So church historian B.B. Edwards wrote, Athanasius, a semi-Trinitarian, and Marcellus, a modalist, Bishop of Ancyra, appear to have been the two principal speakers in behalf of the Orthodox party and to have been the agents on whom most of the doings of the council depended. End quote. Here we can see that the Athanasian camp, along with the Marcellan camp, united together on the behalf of the Orthodox party, in other words, those that believed in the deity of Christ, against Arianism. Under monarchianism, the New Advent Encyclopedia says, and I quote, in the 4th century, the Arians and semi-Arians profess to be much afraid of it. The context proves oneness modalism. And indeed, the alliance of Pope Julius and Athanasius with Marcellus gave some color to the accusations against the Nicene formulas as opening the way to Sibelianism. End quote. If historians are correct about the alliance of the Athanasian camp, with the Marcellan camp, we can be certain that modalistic doctrine contributed to the development of the 325 AD Nicene Creed. In fact, Athanasius actually borrowed terms from the Sibelians in developing the Nicene Creed of 325 AD. The book entitled The Select Treatises of Athanasius in Controversy with the Arians says, and I quote, it has been noted that the Greek term homoousion, or consubstantial, which Athanasius of Alexandria favored, was actually a term reported to be put forth by Sibelius. Sibelius was a modalist, one this modalist, and was a term that many followers of Athanasius were uneasy about. Their objection to the term homoousion was that it was considered to be unscriptural, suspicious, and of a Sibelian tendency. End quote. In his lectures, Dr. Morrison spoke as if there were no modalists alive during the Council of Nicaea. In fact, in my debate with Dr. Morrison, Mr. Morrison stated that Marcellus of Ancyra was after Nicaea. These were the exact words that Mr. Morrison said in our debate. If Marcellus of Ancyra was after Nicaea, then why do church historians state that Marcellus of Ancyra was one of the chief principal speakers on the behalf of the Orthodox party? Anyone who studies church history knows that Marcellus of Ancyra was a modalist. He was accused of Sabellian theology by those who knew his teaching. Author Paul Pavau affirmed, and I quote, It is thought that modalist bishops and Nicaean bishops allied together against the Arians, who are still numerous after Nicaea. Mr. Paul Pavau is, is basically stating that the Trinitarian Nicaean bishops united with the oneness or modalistic bishops of Nicaea against Arianism because both modalists and semi-Trinitarian bishops united together in their efforts against Arianism and semi-Arianism at the Council of Nicaea. Bishop Jerry Hayes is a prominent oneness author, apologist, and debater for the Apostolic Christian Faith, who wrote on his online blog, and I quote, Concerning the Council of Nicaea and the creed it produced, 
I do happen to have some very definite thoughts. First, I believe it was a council that was dominated by the modalist bishops present, even though they were the minority. End quote. Here we can see that I'm not the only one, this author, and I'm not the only one, this apologist, who believed that at the Council of Nicaea, the modalistic bishops were present as well, and they had a very big influence on the outcome of the Nicene Creed and Nicene Council at 325 AD. Jerry Hayes further wrote, and I quote, The Creed of Nicaea, also called the Creed of the 318, for the number of bishops who signed it at the Council of Nicaea, according to Athanasius, was formulated around the word homoousia, which was the watchword for the modalists. The purpose of the council was to formulate a common creed that would put the followers of Arius out of fellowship. The modalist monarchians' watchword, homoousia, would do the trick, so to speak. End quote. Jerry Hayes further wrote, If the thinking of the time is to be understood and considered, that the Son was the thought, logos means the expressed thought of a person, that the Son was the expressed thought of the Father, which had eternality with the Father, for who can conceive of God without his thought, who, the Word, the logos, was indeed the same as the Father, then the Creed of Nicaea is a monarchian document, not Trinitarian. End quote. Here we see that one this author and apologist, very smart man, who studies church history in great depth, expounds the evidence that oneness modalistic monarchianism not only influenced the Nicene Creed of 325 AD, but it dominated the Creed of 325 AD. Author Jerry Hayes clearly expounded the truth about early Christian church history, that the Nicene Creed is a monarchian, oneness document, not Trinitarian. Now this may shock a lot of people, but if you study the Nicene Creed in depth and you study the background of how the Nicene Creed was produced, we find not only the evidence that modalism influenced the Nicene Creed, it also is more in line with modalism than it is with Trinitarianism. According to church historian J. N. D. Kelly, the majority of the 318 bishops were uncomfortable with the creed formulated at Nicaea, but were forced to sign the creed in that it was the only wording that the Arians could not sign. End quote. There is absolutely no historical evidence to suggest that the early Nicene Creed of 325 was against modalism. Nor is there any evidence to suggest that the Nicene Creed of 325 was a Trinitarian creed. Church historian B.B. Edwards pointed out that the early 325 Nicene Creed actually contradicts later Trinitarianism while affirming oneness modalism. And I quote from church historian B.B. Edwards, It lies, moreover, on the very face of the Nicene Creed that it acknowledges the Father only as the monad of the Godhead. The word monad means a single individual or a single entity. The Father is the only true God. And then he cites the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, only one true God the Father, maker of all things, visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the anointed one, the anointed son, the son of God, the only begotten of the Father, etc. Church historian B.B. Edwards goes on to state, Jesus Christ, as here presented to us, is not the one God, as another one God person, as a, another true God person beside the Father, Jesus Christ, as here presented to us, is not the one God, but the one Lord who was begotten or born of the substance of the one God or the Father, etc. The Father, then, as presented in this creed, is not merely a distinct persons, i.e., not merely one of the three persons, on an equality with the other two, 
but he is the original, independent, self-existent monad." End quote. Here we have the evidence from a Trinitarian church historian showing that the original Nicene Creed of 325 AD was not a Trinitarian Creed, that it actually contradicts Trinitarian theology while supporting oneness theology in that there's only one true God, the Father, the only monad, the only single individual entity of the Godhead, and that Jesus Christ was produced or born from the substance of the Father, the essence of being of the Father, to become a human being. This is oneness theology, this is modalistic monarchian theology, and this is not Trinitarian theology. Therefore, the early 325 Nicene Creed was not only influenced, and I might add heavily influenced by the modalistic monarchian theology, but the early Nicene Creed of 325 AD actually supports oneness theology rather than Trinitarian theology. For weekly videos, you may subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us on our website at apostolicchristianfaith.com. God bless.